Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for being here, and we want to thank Clallam County for letting us use this facility. My name is Nancy Estev, and I'll be moderating this evening. Uh, we have candidates for the Port of Port Angeles Commissioner and for Fire District Number 2 Commission. Our timers are Helga and Tom Montgomery up here in the front. And we'll have time limits for the questions as well as for the answers. And their job is to make sure people follow the time limits. The League of Women Voters is a 97-year-old nonpartisan organization, and our purpose is to promote the informed and active participation of citizens in government. Our goal for tonight's forum is to provide Clallam County citizens with the information they need to help them be informed and knowledgeable voters. You can find more information about the League on the membership table near the door or by going to our website, which you can see on the banner in front of us. The League has printed the propositions on this year's general election ballot along with information from the online voters guide on the Clallam County website. And they can be found on the information table, which is right over there. The proposals are Clallam County Proposition 1 is a tax for the juvenile detention facility. The City of Port Angeles Proposition 1 is a change in the city's form of government. City of Port Angeles Proposition number 2 would be for fluoridation of the municipal water supply. The Metropolitan Park Proposition 1 is um, taking on debt to renovate and expand the community pool. And please note, if you need them, the restrooms are right out there. And in case of emergency, um, you get out through those doors. We're video recording this forum and we'll have a link to it posted on the League's website within the next few days. We're here to learn from and about the candidates for the Port of Port Angeles Commissioner and the Fire District 2 Commissioner races that will appear on the November 7 general election ballot and there are two candidates for each of these races. Two candidates are running for Port of Port Angeles Commissioner and they are Michael Cobb and Colleen McAleer and they will speak first. Two candidates are running for Fire District 2 Commissioner Position 1. They are Tom Martin. Is Tom, Tom has raised his hand back there. <clears throat> and Patricia Reifenstahl, and she is up here. And they will speak after the port candidates at a short break. We'll be following the agenda you were given when you came in, and in alphabetical order, we'll ask each candidate to make an opening statement of no more than two minutes. Following the opening remarks, it will be your turn to, and you may pose questions for one or more of the candidates. You'll have 30 seconds to ask your question, and the candidates will have one minute to answer each question. So please think about that when crafting your question. I will then give each candidate 30 seconds for a rebuttal if they wish to make one. League volunteers have index cards and pencils for you so you can write down your questions, which is really a good idea. If you are uncomfortable asking your question yourself, you may hand your card to a League volunteer who will give it to the League member who will be at the microphone. You may address your question to a particular candidate or to both candidates. However, both candidates will be given the opportunity to answer all questions. We'll give everyone in the audience the chance to ask a question before taking follow-ups or multiple questions from the same person. We'll give each candidate up to two minutes for closing remarks, and this will happen in the reverse order. Now to the opening remarks. We've asked the candidates to introduce themselves by covering the following information in their opening statements their qualifications for office, how do they intend to address the major, major challenges facing the Port of Port Angeles, and what are their goals for their term in office. Candidates, please keep your eye on our timers so you can gauge your time. In alphabetical order, we'll begin with Michael Cobb. Thank you and good evening, everybody. Uh, for introduction, I was always interested in business, and even from an early age, when I sold chickens from our large flock that I maintained. So it only made sense for me to go to business school at the University of Washington where I majored in finance. 
after that, the Navy beckoned, and it made sense for me to be involved in the business part of the Navy, where after a lot of training, I ended up being a finance officer at a large overseas Navy base. Uh, looking back on that experience, uh, I found that my annual expenditures that went through my office were about equal to the annual budget for Clallam County today. After the Navy, more education loomed, and so I went to the Seattle University for my graduate degree in accounting, but I also had to work full-time at Seattle First National Bank. So I got a chance to get exposed from a different side of business. After graduating, I was recruited to go down to the First Interstate Bank in Oregon, where I became a senior lender, learning more about business, where I was asked to join one of our largest clients, a manufacturing company with international operations and sales and manufacturing. Um, my business experience uh, grew over time, lots of manufacturing, lots of different businesses, ended up owning and running my own business in uh, a number of years until I sold it to move to, uh, to SQUIM about five years ago. Key issues, I, I intend to deal with key issues at the port by using the team approach to management that I found so important in business. You can't do it yourself, you have to work as a team. Primary goals for the first year, I want to promote a more diverse effort to, to encourage new business and growing business in Clown County as opposed to all the eggs in one basket approach with the Composite Recycling Training Technology Center that we have up here. It's an early, early experience with chickens, you see. So, and adding to that, I'd like to see waterfront capabilities increased with a large vessel washdown facility, which would help both the existing tenants and new tenants for our city. Thank you. And now, Colleen McAleer. So thank you very much for coming today. I counted about 40 people. I wish we had about twice as many because the Port of Port Angeles is an incredibly important entity to change our local economy so that our citizens in Clallam County have the opportunity to prosper. Uh, quickly, my background, 10 years in the military, I was a pilot and military intelligence officer, a combat veteran stationed all around the world. Um, I also had 10 years of commercial real estate experience in this county, and now I lead the Washington Business Alliance, uh, which is a statewide business organization. I'm running again because I'm very passionate about the port and my belief that it is the entity that should be driving economic prosperity and we can be more effective. Uh, and that's why in 2014 I left a six figure a year job for a less than minimum wage position because I felt like I needed to be, as a, I needed to take the role of a commissioner so that I could uh, be part of a remarkable change, which now has occurred and I'm really proud to be a part of. Uh, my qualifications, obviously, as a commissioner, I was on staff for two years, and I have the other pieces, I have a vast network. Through the Washington Business Alliance, I've been able to work with very uh, influential, wealthy people that uh, I have now been able to take a lot of their investment funds, and we've been able to invest that into businesses in Clallam County. Uh, plus the relationships with the legislature, the governor's office, and Department of Commerce. The how is through this strategic plan. We've not done no, numerous meetings, uh, dozens of meetings over 2015 and 16 with the public to determine what should that be. And my one-year goal would be to uh, help redevelop the Marine Trades Industrial Park, make sure that it is uh, it is redeveloped so that we have the best possible opportunities for our community there. Thank you. Thank you. Um, now, we will take as many questions as possible from you, the audience. And where is our microphone going to be? Oh, all right. Great. So, um, if you have a question, you should line up, I guess, right in the middle aisle. And, and if you would like a card, here they are. Just raise your hand and someone will bring you a card. Um, so all the candidates will have the opportunity to respond to all of the questions. And I expect that we'll have about 30 minutes for this part of our program. But that's an estimate. Okay, we apologize in advance if we don't have enough time for all of your questions. Um, 
but we have asked the candidates to stay afterwards. Do we have any questions? What's just, coming up? Just go, go up to the microphone. Because we have an official microphone person. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Ron Richards. I live on uh, Township, Township Line Road. Uh, Colleen, I found it interesting your comment that you just made about investment funds and, and meeting lots of wealthy people. Uh, and you said, we've been able to take their money and reinvest those in Clement County. I'm wondering who those people are and where the money has been reinvested. So much of those investments were private investments from uh, the Clean Tech Alliance um, investors, Element 8, is an investment group out of Bremerton. Additionally, um, the Kiretsu Forum is a group of angel investors, and then also some of my board members, to be quite honest with you. Uh, one of them is the former uh, CEO and founder of Sonicare Toothbrush, and another one is Howard Behar, who was the, um, who was the, uh, uh, founding president of Starbucks International. So there have been a myriad of companies that they've invested in locally to include um, some names such as uh, uh, Airborne ECS and Armstrong and some others. Well, Colin, you mentioned that in the context of being a court commission. Were these investments made through the court or is this just the private investment you're doing on the side? Uh, I put people together. This, the, the investments that I have officially been involved with as a port commissioner were through the Department of Commerce uh, and then also with the Economic Development Administration through the U.S. Department of Commerce. So uh, 1.3, a total of 2.7 million from the Clean Energy Funds. Uh, which come through the Department of Commerce. $40 million was uh, available in the last legislative biennium. And the, uh, what came to the Port Angeles was uh, $2.7 million in total over a two-year cycle. And then additionally from the Economic Development Administration, $1.5 million to our, redevelop our marine trades Mer the Marine Terminal, Terminal 1, and then also $2 million that went into the building that the port owns, uh, that the Composite Recycling Technology Center and Peninsula College both lease from the port today. All right, Mr. Cobb, would you like to respond? Well, there's a lot of numbers, but I think the biggest single number that I've heard and, and adding up uh, from various sources is the CRTC. Uh, near as I can tell, about $8 million has been committed. $6 million, according to valuation of the uh, property uh, for purposes of determining what a fair market rent would be, and a lot of other equipment as well. So most of the investment that I've heard of seems to be centered there. I do think the, the, the port was effective in getting uh, money to help clean up the, the old pin ply site and that will be a great opportunity to expand our operations on the port. On the port. Thank you. Is there another question? I have a written question. All right. Uh, what will each of you do to provide transparency of business to the people of Collin County? Mr. Cobb, you should begin first. Well, thank you. Well, I firmly believe, as an accountant, of course, I firmly believe in clear, concise financial statements. And reading the annual reports from the port, they seem to be a little bit obscure, a little bit detailed, and a little bit contradictory. So I would like to encourage the accounting management to uh, improve their game, if you will, and make it more, uh, more available, more accessible, uh, perhaps with a summary that makes more sense to business people uh, that aren't familiar with all the accounting in a government entity. All right, Ms. McAleer. Thank you. Um, well, first off, I'd like to share with you that that has been one of my biggest issues, is transparency and accountability. Uh, I pushed really hard to ensure the port 
uh, staff would share information with the um, commissioners because transparency starts with staff to commissioners. We are part-time. We went from two meetings a month to weekly meetings where we uh, had work sessions that were open to the public where we discussed uh, our uh, more details so the commissioners had a better understanding of what the uh, issues were that they were responsible to decide on. And additionally, we received an award from the Coalition of Open Governments uh, for our hiring process of Karen Goshen. And again, in that situation, I really pushed for, we've got to do this publicly. We need to get public input. They need to hear us interview these people. So I think we have a much better track record than what was there before. All right, do we have another question? Yes, ma'am, if you'll get, come up to the mic. Hi, Rosemary Cockrell. And you mentioned a lot of numbers, Ms. McClear, but and very little in the line of how many jobs this actually brought to Clallam County. I'd like to know what those jobs amount to. Certainly. Yes, yeah, okay. go ahead. Um, I'm happy to share that with you. As I recall, so far the CRTC, which is a startup and they're going to be growing over time, has now created 12 jobs, but the intent there is for them to spin off businesses and spin off products. So uh, that, that number is associated with the CRTC, but Airborne ECS that has hundreds of millions of dollars in contracts with large companies expects at least 50 jobs over the next uh, year or so. And that's one that uh, I, I worked with that company at length to try to get them here in this community. Uh, the owner was formerly the general manager of GE Aviation Division. He grew up in Joyce, however, and his company was in New York and now he has relocated uh, to Port Angeles um, and, and is starting the production facility here in Port Angeles. Mr. Cobb? Yes, I think that uh, the 12 uh, full-time equivalent jobs at CRTC is a pretty accurate measure of what they have uh, been able to secure to date. I think going forward, the challenge will be to generate enough revenue to pay those 12 people plus the opportunity to hire additional people in the future. That future is somewhat in doubt based on the public information that's been shared uh, with uh, the commissioners and the public in general at recent meetings. I know the uh, Airborne uh, uh, company is a good opportunity for, for new jobs. Reading their um, website and talking about Port Angeles, they're planning on doing production of, this, of uh, the, some of their components here. Uh, that's a startup operation from start, and of course, that will depend on their success in generating new business with components that they can make. So it's not going to be easy for them, but I'd like to uh, offer our support from the port standpoint to make sure that they can realize all the opportunities that are out there for them. Thank you. Other questions? I'm Mary Alice Bolter, and I live in Port Angeles. Uh, this is directed to Mr. Cobb. Your um, list of qualifications and education is very impressive. And thank you for letting us know what your background is. However, both your seeming disregard for basic voter registration requirements and lack of ethics in reporting the residents falsely do concern me. Such a cavalier attitude is troubling. Why should we trust you to properly conduct yourself as a board representative at all times? Well, thank you for the opportunity to address that question, which was raised early on in the campaign. Um, I originally registered to vote using the address where I kept my vote at John Wayne Marina. The reason was to protect my partner from the occurrence of domestic violence, which she suffered in the past. I think that was a valid reason to try and protect our uh, residential address. It was certainly uh, not to profit uh, and not to hurt anybody. Uh, so that was my intent. And uh, subsequently, I learned that I could uh, get an address confidentiality, security, where I can be fully registered as to where I live with a 
uh, auditor's office, but that information is sealed, and I have an address in Olympia if anybody cares to write to me. Thank you. Do you wish to say anything? No. All right. More questions? Yes. Hi, it's Steve Burke in, on Deer Park Road. I would just would, this is for both of you, just if you could share what you see as some of the challenges upcoming for the port and how you would work at uh, trying to surmount those challenges. Ms. McAleer, would you begin? Certainly. Always our biggest challenge is creating jobs for our community and finding those opportunities where we can have living wage jobs and the port can support that. Uh, there are there are lots of opportunities for less than uh, living wage, but that doesn't support our community. The young people that are striving to uh, stay in this community, which I think we all want, and some retirees and um, just those that are under, underemployed and unemployed. So. Uh, we're constantly, our team, uh, in partnership with the EDC, is constantly out there working with uh, existing businesses and potentially new businesses, which I'm happy to be able to be a, a part of through my position at the Washington Business Alliance. I always tell everyone that I have a very clear bias, and that's for Clallam County, and I love to tell the story about Clallam County. Mr. Cobb? Yes, I'd like to see more uh, diverse investment in new business here rather than concentrating uh, such a large amount of money in one uh, technology. Uh, I, I think in my experience in starting businesses and helping finance businesses that are starting up, there is a fairly high mortality rate. Only about 10% uh, of businesses survive the five-year period. So don't put all your eggs in one basket. It's challenging to start and build a business. Let's give them the support that they need, but let's not, uh, let's not limit it, our options. Uh, we need to work together with all the government entities, and I think I've seen uh, recently in the last uh, five years that uh, the port and the county work, are starting to work and communicate more effectively. I'd like to continue that and encourage that uh, together in the future. Thank you. More questions? Yes. Betsy Robbins, Port Angeles. How do you define a living wage? <coughs> Mr. Cobb, you will go first. I think the living wage would have to be something greater than the minimum wage that you're talking about at $15 an hour. I think a living wage has to be in the area of $50,000 a year uh, to support uh, a family of, of three or four. Uh, the statistics uh, for average income in Collin County are actually less than that. So I'd like to see more jobs on the high end of that scale. We have to have people that are qualified uh, and capable of holding those jobs. So it has to be a combination of job opportunity as well as training for people to hold those jobs. And that's a real challenge. Many of the business people that I talk with indicate it's hard to find good people to fill jobs that are open today, especially if they have to take a drug test. Mm -hmm. Ms. Beckler? Yes, so uh, living wage is defined officially by the Employment Security Department. And the last I checked, it was $17.76 an hour. However, as affordable housing costs are increasing and utility costs are increasing, that will increase what the, the uh, living wage for uh, our community is. Um, MIT has a website that calculates it as well. But in order for us to pursue grants, uh, whether they be community economic rede redevelopment uh, board grants or um, different economic development grants, we have to show that the jobs that are being created will be more than the calculated minimum wage. And that typically is what is a, the, the wage that is needed for a family of four to be able to have, I believe it's 30% uh, available for uh, the housing and all of their other needs and be able to put some money into retirement as well. All right, any more questions? It's a very trusting, you're letting us hold the <laughs> microphone. Um, anyway, um, since the port 
is the only entity that is mandated to do economic development. And given that it's not surprising there's only a few people here, because the general public doesn't seem to understand what the port does or doesn't, what concrete ideas would you have to get the public engaged and involved and moving forward for how the port can expand economic development and understand the other things the port does? Thank you. Uh, Ms. McNamara, you're first. Okay. Well, one of the things we've done is we have a port pilot here. So that goes into the newspaper. They're here. I brought some extra copies so that the community can understand what a port does. Uh, and you're right, the port's the only entity within uh, any uh, special district or municipal government across the state that doesn't, isn't confined by the law of you can't gift public funds. And we are the only ones that are charged to uh, try to create economic prosperity. There are 75 port districts across the state, 12 that are port-wide port districts, which the Port of Port Angeles is one of them. So we have this exceptional tool that we should be making sure we're maximizing its effectiveness. And um, so I'm, we've been reaching out with our community partnership program, which is giving back to the entire community grants um, on an annual basis, where we provide 70, we've provided for the last three years 70,000 to different nonprofits across the county. Mr. Cobb? Well, thank you for that question, because I do find that many people that I talk to don't, don't know what the port does. What's why is it important to me? And I think with any, any challenge of presenting information, you have to look at it as basically a marketing, a sales and marketing plan, if you will. Over half the people in this country now get most of, if not all of their news from Facebook, if you can believe that. So I think social media has to be one conduit where the port could talk about their activities and especially bringing younger people into the fold. So that would be one. I think uh, periodic articles uh, in, the, in the newspaper, uh, newsworthy articles, uh, as well as having a good website uh, with constant update of information about port activities. Uh, so I think a combination of all of those elements uh, can be used to enhance the port's impact on the community and to get people involved and engaged in what the port is trying to encourage for our community. Thank you. And more questions? Yes, go to the microphone. Hi, Rachel Ringer, Port Angeles. Um, my question is, is that you were talking about um, living wages and economic development. Um, so my thing is, my question is, is how would you collaborate with other entities like the school board, the hospital, city council, um, the city management, and citizens in order to bring in the jobs that are needed um, when we're having difficulties with our schools, um, with funding for buildings that are falling apart and different plans. So um, please, can you tell what your role would be in helping in collaboration to bring in jobs like that? Thank you. That's a, big, that's a big order, Rachel. I, uh, I think that I think there there are a lot of needs, and as to be uh, to be to be frank, uh, it, it really is not uh, likely to be a port responsibility to uh, help the development of schools and so forth. But I think all of us can work together in the community with the other community organizations, the county, the city, and particularly the college to. Uh, and synchronize the kind of training that we know as business people and as uh, uh, county people what kind of jobs are needed, uh, what, kind of, what kind of training for jobs are needed, and to uh, synchronize those activities. Um, and uh, that is uh, a complicated question, and I appreciate the opportunity to, to attempt to answer it. And Ms. McElroy? Uh, yes, so uh, item number four on the port strategic plan is enhanced stakeholder engagement and outreach er efforts. So we have uh, four different initiatives as we're trying to work through that. We do um, have a, we have a, uh, we've been 
instituting uh, joint meetings with the Forks City Council, with the Squim City Council, with the Port Angeles City Council, and with our county government, we have now quarterly meetings. Um, additionally, from a school district perspective, that's a, I've got kids, that is um, an area that I could get talking about, but specifically there's RCW that prevents a port from engaging actively in workforce development. So we have partnered very closely with the Small Business Development Center, the EDC, and others to fund them so that they can be very effective in creating opportunities. Additionally, we've worked with different entities to say what's our one big thing we want and it's getting a bond passed and so we've passed resolutions saying it's critical to have a bond passed in Clallam County in Port Angeles and Squim. And more questions? Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Kahn. Uh, you do. Oh, I answered that. I, yes. I addressed yeah, it first. Thank you. Yeah. Do we maybe have I more could, questions? Maybe I could answer, enhance that on question. Oh. <laughs> and do we have more questions? If you have answered, asked a question before, go ahead, uh, because we do have, seem to have time. Well, just to follow up on that last one, how is all that going? I, I see a lot of work being done and a lot of goals, for example, building new schools. But until we increase the, the tax base, and it wouldn't cost an arm and a leg for everybody in this town to do that, it's very difficult to have that happen. So I guess, where, what do you see going forward? What kind of progress do you really feel is being made? Ms. McAleer, you begin. So I'll tell you what, when I got to the port six years ago, there really wasn't this outreach effort. And um, that's something that the port has taken on. And, to, and it begins with finding out, we met with the PUD and said, you guys are the experts on broadband. Are there opportunities where we can be of assistance? Does that make sense? How can we partner to create better access to high-speed internet across our county? And so asking those questions and working with elected uh, is important. Are you getting answers? I mean, asking is one thing, but are you getting an answer and able to move forward? We are, in, in that particular case, they kind of said, we got it handled. Uh, however, in, in all these different areas, more minds are better, and we can't have siloed organizations. So I'd, I'd say we are making progress. It's not as fast as I'd like. I worked with the Port of Seattle commissioners, and they said they've got the exact same problem that 20 years ago they were saying nobody understands what the port does, and today they're saying nobody understands what the port does. So it's a it's a statewide issue. Mr. Cobb? Well, I think the fundamentals are jobs and, and improved economic development in our city and our county. That means bringing people that, to live here who may be able to telecommute and live where they want to live, to live in a nice environment. And I think the port can have a role in enhancing our environment, making our waterfront a little more attractive and encouraging some um, tourist type activities, although it's certainly not the number one priority, but I think it would help uh, in, uh, in working with other uh, community organizations to come up with a vision for what the uh, what the city and what the county should look like in the future. But it all comes back to economic development. If there are more people moving here for jobs that are here, that's going to be a greater tax base. It's going to mean uh, more houses are built. That's going to mean a better um, tax base for our schools. Thank you. Anyone? Anyone? Yes, go ahead. So basically my first question, I felt the first half of it was answered, how are you going to do outreach, let people know who you are, but the second half didn't get answered, and that is, I believe that none of us are as smart as all of us, and so what we are you going, what can you do to get the community together to talk about some creativity and access the amazing expertise we have hiding out in the corners of this county to get the general citizenry involved in helping you create some economic development plans. Does that make sense? 
Uh, all I can tell you is that when I was at Bob 20 years ago, I was blown away by the expertise that hides out in this mm -hmm. community. And Mr. Cobb, you'll begin. Well, I agree with you, uh, Norma. There, there is a great deal of talent in our community, and that's one of the things I've enjoyed most about campaigning, is meeting all of these people and finding out what kind of background and talent we do have available. To bring that talent to work on projects for the community is a challenge. And I think you, as a, an organization, have to reach out to them, uh, have some clearly identified opportunities for them to participate. Uh, maybe there will be some activities, uh, some sort of a, a port fair or something like that, where port activities are really talked about. And we engage the community. We ask for and show people how they can actually contribute, how they can uh, work uh, to support the activities that we're trying to promote. Ms. McAleer? Um, so, I don't love debating, but one, po I don't like it at all, to be honest with you, but one really positive thing that comes out of this is community engagement and the conversation about sharing what does a port do and getting input from the community. I see our commissioners, and we've got three really active commissioners now that have expertise in different areas, and they are at meetings constantly. Uh, you know, th again, this is really is pretty much a volunteer position, so I commend Mr. Cobb for running it for this. Uh, and it's reaching out and talking to people, whether it be at a chamber meeting, at an NODC meeting, at an EDC meeting, or through campaigns, through events like this with the League of Washington Women Voters, or um, or Seroptimus, Kiwanis Club, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So. Yeah, it, the staff, we have eight business lines and the staff operates those business lines and so we have very little staffing available for this kind of thing. So that's the role typically our commissioners hold. All right, more questions? Yes. Paula Barnes, Squim. You both touched on this a couple of questions ago and that's the question of uh, broadband internet access. It's very much, robust internet access is very much a utility nowadays. And it's essential to, I believe, to an economic development and to attracting uh, the kind of workforce um, that we want to have in the county. What specific ideas do you have for how the port could encourage uh, broad, robust broadband internet access throughout the county? Mr. Cobb, you have to Well, I'm going to be honest here and say sorry, that I Ms. don't know. I, I, I screwed up. Oh. Ms. McAleer, if that's oh, good. I'll let you answer that. Then I'll, then I'll play out your answer. So I had an opportunity to meet with the governor's uh, ICT, Information Communications and Telecom uh, Sector Lead. And there, is, there, was, there were several bills before the legislature to expand port authorities so that ports could uh, work within the broadband space. However, those, thing, those different bills did not move forward. What he would like WPPA to do, Washington Public Ports Authority and the Washington Business Alliance, the organization I run, is for us to support a broadband commission for the state so that studies can be done and truly understand what is the infrastructure that's available in these rural communities. There's no problem in Seattle, Tacoma, and, and Vancouver, Spokane, but in rural communities, there are so many dry spots where you know we don't have cellular uh, coverage and there's a move for 5G to be installed, but they're going to put them on telephone poles, which is going to just increase our costs. So it's a complex issue, but that's one I've been working on. And now, Mr. Cobb? I'll agree it's a complex issue. <laughs> part, of the, part of the challenge, though, for smaller communities is to have the, uh, the economic um, engine, if you will, that is appealing for uh, commercial entities, entities to bring those services to uh, these communities. So uh, many times uh, you, we've seen or I've heard of uh, cities, uh, counties, and towns really investing heavily themselves out of their budgets to, to establish this kind of service because the, the, the demand, I mean the economic uh, engine isn't there for commercial activities to develop it. And I would support that. I think it's so essential 
to any business these days and anybody that wants to move and live to our beautiful area that wants to be able to telecommute. I mean, we have to use a satellite to get our internet and I have to tell you it's not always the brightest bulb in the sky because when there is a lot of cloud cover it doesn't work very well. So I would certainly like to see an improved system. Okay, more questions? My name is Melanie Greer. I live in Port Angeles. Um, yeah, so my question is that uh, the economy is changing quickly and the nature of jobs are changing quickly and it seems that uh, the low carbon economy is coming and I want to know what your plans are for how the port can adjust and stay up with the times and how you plan on preparing for the future low carbon economies. So you mean low carbon economy? Is that what you're talking about? Yes. Oh, good. I didn't quite hear that. Thank you. Mr. Cobb, you do the get this time. I do get to go first. Okay. All right. Yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> well, the, the nature of jobs are changing, and I think the low carbon aspect of it is something that even large industries like the automobile industry are coming to terms with. I just read today that General Motors is planning on introducing 20 or 30 different models of electric cars. And I think that's really going to be a plus for the future and uh, to get away from the pollution and the use of uh, carbon fuels which contribute to our global warming. Uh, that being said, uh, the nature of jobs have changed quite a bit and it's so essential for people in the workforce and wanting to join the workforce to be educated and not just ed educated in one set of skills but to educate themselves on how to continue learning throughout their lifetime because uh, both Colleen and I have had very very different experiences we've had to reinvent ourselves about what six times anyway and you know, we've got a few more years to go so that that kind of attitude has to be encouraged with our young people so when we talk about a low carbon economy, it, there are lots of opportunities that I believe Clallam County can be engaged in. Uh, one is through transportation opportunities with electric vehicles. Uh, we've supported different grants so that when uh, people come to the Olympic Peninsula, there are uh, quick charge stations along uh, Highway 101. Additionally, uh, one of the reasons why we really pursued the Composite Recycling Technology Center is because we knew we needed to diversify our economy in a green manner. And this is taking uh, materials that were headed for the landfill that had to be autoclave cured and making new products out of them. And so from that standpoint, they're looking at products, CPAC, uh, CPACs, as an example, to lightweight vehicles and becoming part of that new transformation. Um, and also, I've been proposing that our port have, well, I'll tell you another time. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions? Yes, yes ma'am. Uh, anyone else? All right, go ahead. Speaking of the CRTC, their uh, assistant funding is running out pretty quickly. And it looks to me like they have a long way to go before they have any kind of product to market. What about that? Are you going to end up with a building that you need to find a new tenant for pretty quick? Yes, you first. Okay. Well, that's a good question. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Are you first this time? Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, so they have over a million dollars worth of contracts with for research projects. And that, as I understand, will take them at least through uh, the first three quarters of the year um, between their I-6 grants and the Institute of Composites. They have been, there's a national entity that's at Oak Ridge National Labs and in uh, Ohio, and they have contracted with the CRTC to do that research work. So they have those funds that will take them through that period at least. And then also they have, working with Janicki and other um, companies, they have solid contracts where they're making prototypes currently. But again, this is, it is a startup, they do need time. But I have complete faith in, um, in 
uh, Dave Walters, who spent 34 years as an executive at DuPont, was a global product manager, and he knows what he's doing, and I'm, I'm really hopeful. As far as I can determine from public records that are available to all of us, uh, the cash flow situation doesn't look quite so rosy. They have been successful in getting grants to bring new equipment in. They did get a grant for $373,000 for the ACTI uh, group to you know, try to understand how to use the uncured material that they have. But looking back at what they did announce here recently, the product that they made, the seat back product they made, was not out of the uncured material, which is brought up here by a refrigerated truck. It was by re constituted material baked in an oven in Nottinghamshire, England, and brought over here pre-impregnated with resin that the CRTC pressed into a seat back. So it isn't exactly uh, taking the, the product that we have coming up by truck from Tacoma to uh, build new products. It's something altogether different. Uh, it's, it's good to use that material, but it's not quite the same uh, uh, target as they shot for initially. And anyone else? All right. Well, as your moderator, I have messed up. I was supposed to allow them each to do a rebuttal after each question, which I didn't do. And therefore, I'd like to allow each of you two minutes to do any rebuttal of previous questions. first. <laughs> 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 Well, first of all, uh, one thing I did write down is that we do have a Facebook page that uh, we put out information on a pretty regular basis. Um, and it does have, I hope you go there and take a look at it. Um, uh, and we also have a, a strong website that's being redeveloped for current technology so that we also have a mobile site that's very um, usable as well. And, oh, one thing I did want to bring up is um, our work around cross-laminated timber. Uh, uh, a lot of our staff went up to Pinkerton, I hope I said that right, British Columbia, recently to work with one of the largest manufacturers in uh, cross-laminated timber today, that's in British Columbia, and we're working on how can we ensure that our Olympic coastal wood could be used in a product and we're hoping that there might be an opportunity for Interfor's wood to be used in this cross laminated timber uh, uh, material that can be used for tall wood buildings. Mr. Well, I'd like to stress again my interest in developing diverse efforts to invest in new uh, startups and bringing new business to our county. Uh, I don't want to see us go down the road of putting all of our eggs in one basket and risking the obvious risk that comes with any new venture. They don't always work out. That's just the fact of life. So we'd like to also make sure that when we invest in a new business that we have a clear understanding of what their business plan is. Does it make sense? And do they have an understanding of what their competitive advantage is so they can actually have a good shot of being successful? I think the port and the staff and the commissioners working together with the county commissioners and the other people involved in the community can be very instrumental in making that happen. And now you get two more minutes, each of you, for your official closing statements. And Ms. McElroy will go first. Okay, thank you. Um, again, I'm, I'm hoping to be your quote commissioner again, and I'm hoping that you'll consider voting for me. And the reason is I truly care about this community. I was an Army brat and then in the military and then uh, came here to Clown County. This is my home. I raised my kids here. I really care about it. I watched young children that started up as the cutest little bugs turn into people that were doing things that they shouldn't have been doing. And over and over when I looked into this, what was the driver? It was their parents were not actively engaged in the community. They didn't have a living wage job. And so they weren't engaged with their children and therefore 
all sorts of problems came about. I, I don't want to see that happen for this community. I want, I want to change it and be part of a movement that I know the team at the port is really working towards, and I know my fellow commissioners really feel the same way. Um, I, I'm hoping that uh, through time, and it does take a lot longer time than I'd like to see it happen. Um, I'm an impatient individual myself, and I've been trying to learn patience. But, uh, you know, we have eight business lines that we operate and that support, uh, that support industry across our county. I'd like to see more diver diversification from a geographical standpoint. Um, over in the West End, we have uh, CQ Airport, and that's pretty much it. And over on the East End, we have the John Wayne Marina. And all of our other assets are right in Port Angeles. We do a fantastic job, but being creative and talking about how can we do more is an open conversation that I want to continue to have with the community. And so I'm open to that. I'm interested in hearing your input, and I ask for your vote. Thank you. Mr. Cobb? Well, thank you. In closing, I'd like to have the opportunity to look back after four years of service on the Port Commission uh, to see a stronger economic community by working together with the other organizations in our county, the city, the Economic Development Corporation, and the citizens of our community for more family wage jobs with new companies and also encouraging the existing businesses to grow and add jobs to their uh, envir for our environment as well. I'd like to support, uh, have supported technology training uh, by our local college and expanded and diversified marine trade businesses. Those are good, high-paying jobs, anywhere from 20 to 50 to 70 dollars an hour. I'd like to see more of them. And I'd like to see improved waterfront appearance, including upgrades at Boat Haven Marina, and to maintain, uh, maintain the nice marina that we have in John Wayne, uh, keep that for public use and benefit in the future. And if there are developments that are, that are in line for that particular uh, location, I'd like to see that <coughs> development be uh, carefully considered in the use of the port property, rather than selling or trading part of the port property like the south parking area, we, what's wrong with leasing it with some kind of control over what the development is? Because that location is really one of the very few places where the public can actually gain access to Squim Bay. And I'd like to make sure that's protected and enhanced in the future. In summary, I want the best possible future for Clallam County. Uh, an area that, that I've known and loved since I was a kid, coming over to visit my aunt and uncle, and hiking and camping in the Olympic Peninsula. I think it's a good time for me to share my wealth of experience to help our community grow. Thank you both very much. And now, um, we'll take a 10 minute break and return with candidates for fire commissioner. See you 10 minutes. All right, are we ready to begin? We'll ask each candidate again to make an opening statement of no more than two minutes. And we've asked them to include the following, their qualifications, how they intend to address the major challenges facing the fire district number two, and what are their goals for their term in office. And you might want to keep your eye on the timers. We'll begin with Mr. Martin. Um, my name is Tom Martin, and thank you for coming. I've been in the fire service since uh, 1980. Started out as a rookie fire volunteer, and from there uh, got really interested in it, and moved up through the ranks. Also, um, I was the first EMT for the district. Went out on my own and got it. And from there, I convinced the uh, uh, park commissioners that we needed to start an EMS program for Fire District 2. And with their blessings, they gave me the okay to go and start that. And from there, I got into the regional EMS council for three counties. And basically, that's where District 2 EMS program started. Uh, I've, uh, I've had a uh, 
many instances in the fire district where uh, I've seen what we've done save lives, uh, accidents and fires. I've always looked at the district as, a, as something that I want to continue to uh, see prosper. Fire district to me is uh, like a business and we have to run it like a business and we have to continue to keep growing. Um, I don't look at taxpayers, I look at them as um, shareholders. And as a shareholder, they have a vested interest in the, the fire district and what we want to do. That's why I like to incorporate them as uh, shareholders and uh, get their input. From that, it's, uh, it's a continuing of how we improve our uh, um, training, our apparatus, and our skills and our personnel. And from the district, we keep growing. They were talking about people moving into the area with the poor people. And that's a big concern. We have to be able to maintain our services and uh, we have to have the personnel take care of it. We are always uh, looking for volunteers. And in that respect, it's a, it, it's a daunted task. Thank you. All right, and Ms. Reifenstahl? Hi, my name is Patty Reifenstahl. I've lived in Port Angeles since I was 16. I've been part of the um, fire service for the last 16 years. I'm a firefighter EMT. I've been an officer. I um, have had the privilege of being part of people's lives at some of the most tragic times in their life. And I want to work towards a um, friendly fire service that's transparent, with good leadership, that listens to the public, listens to the paid staff, and listens to the volunteers, and, and we work together to, to make this a fire service that grows, that works, that meets the needs of everyone involved, that we have cohesive relationships with our partners surrounding us. And um, I'm just honored to be a part of the fire service. Thank you. All right. Um, now it's your turn for audience questions. And we, we have a little logistic issue, and that is that whoever is standing up there to ask a question can't see the timers. So when the stop sign comes up, I will be able to see it, and then you'll see this. And that means you should stop. All right. Um, do we have any questioners? Yes, ma'am. And you have 30 seconds for your question, and they'll have a minute to answer. I'm Rosemary Cockrell, and I'd like to know how many different fire districts you have, and if they're staffed, and by how many. And we'll begin with Mr. Martin. OK, right now, we have four stations. We have 48 volunteers. We have uh, six line. And then we have two assistant chiefs that are part of that program. Uh, along with uh, the 48 volunteers, 30% are women. And uh, we have, like I say, 14 pieces of uh, apparatus that we uh, are continuing to upgrade. Ms. Biden, is that? I pretty much agree with him. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Another question? Yes. Mickey Vale from Port Angeles. Um, having worked with volunteers for a long time, um, what do you feel is the most important thing in order to be able to recruit committed and trained volunteers to stay with the fire district? And Ms. Reifenstadt, you'll begin. Okay, so this is always this has always been a problem. Um, Recruiting volunteers. Actually, lots of times recruiting isn't the problem. You know, you lead by example. Um, you tell people how awesome it is to serve the community as a volunteer. It's the retention part. Um, retention is hard because when 
when you become a volunteer for fire service, it's not like volunteering at the school or something. It takes a lot of commitment and training. It takes dollars. And sometimes that's very difficult when people come on and then find out how much commitment. So that's one of my things I would really like to work towards, finding what is going to help us retain those volunteers since we are pretty much a volunteer fire department. Mr. Martin? Uh, getting to uh, re uh, the volunteers, um, a lot of people don't understand that um, a volunteer um, the training and everything that goes with it, you're looking, you're looking at about a year. And for some, that's a, a daunting task um, to take their time. But uh, the volunteers, I have to say that um, in, in, in the fire service, there's a brotherhood. It doesn't matter if you're paid or volunteer. And so this, this is where you find out who you really have. And they really put a lot of blood, sweat, and tears into a, um, being a volunteer. Retaining is hard. Some of the young ones move on to other um, paid departments. Um, once again, the port was talking about people moving in. We need more families moving into the area that would want to uh, participate. We're both, even the husband and wife, we've had husband and wife volunteers um, numerous times in the district. Um, retention is a hard thing for us, and, and it's a continuing. We have to sometimes, we're, we're looking at paid personnel. And now I will improve my performance and what they do if you'd like to do a rebuttal. No? <laughs> All right, any more questions? My name is Norma Turner. Um, the fire districts are usually pretty low profile. So I like to ask, so you're both running for the same position. I like to ask each of you what you bring to this position that you think their opponent doesn't, because I don't know why you're running against each other, except that's how it's a good thing to have a choice. <laughs> so uh, if you could help me understand either what your strength is or uh, how you think you differ from your opponent in how you would manage in the job that you'd be in. All right, Mr. Martin, do you go first? Well, my strength has been, um, I've been a commissioner now for 12 years, and besides being in the fire service up through the ranks, but I also have taken many classes as a commissioner. Um, uh, public records, we're continuing to keep upgrading ourselves into public records. Uh, we're also talking about budgets. Uh, I have to say that uh, our district um, had an audit from the state of Washington and we got um, glowing remarks just to the point of they generally do it every year. They told us that they could, uh, could wait on that for two years. We were doing such good in our paper trails that we had no problems, no red flags. Once again, the commissioners, I work with uh, the, the staff and uh, I also like to uh, say that our staff does a great job and they keep us informed. They, they show us if we have a question, um, they're willing to answer my questions. All right. Um, my strength is I'm committed to community. I am a volunteer. I can talk to the volunteers, to the staff, to the officers. Um, I have budget experience, but that was from a swimming pool. <laughs> I used to work in a swimming pool. So I, can, I know about budgets. I haven't had that much in fire service. I think I bring a, um, just a new perspective. The commissioner positions haven't been challenged for years and years and years. So I just believe it's time for change now. And I'm a woman, too. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. And would you each like rebuttal time? Well, um, a commissioner <coughs> is something that's just like a, a volunteer or firefighter. You, uh, you have to maintain um, your skill levels in, uh, in a business aspect. Um, you already have the ba fire background, but now you're into a commissioner. So uh, we have a conference. Uh, once a year that uh, we go and get uh, updated material, training, and uh, it's a constant, even as a commissioner, it's a, it's a constant um, uh, 
trying, trying to acquire the better skills in your job. And uh, I, I have to say that I find it uh, most rewarding um, when the district is uh, able to get grants. Uh, our district does a great job in getting grants. They work very hard. They keep us abreast of what they're trying to do. And uh, it's, uh, it's a thankless job to a, to a certain point because sometimes you don't see it. But the grant does come through and it helps, it helps our shareholders. Yes, uh, I, I have no fear of training at every job I've ever had. I'm out there trying to do the, get the best and be the best that I can. So, um, commissioner position is a, is a learning thing. I, I will do what I need to do to know how to do what I need to do. So, I'll do whatever training I need. I have lots of background. Um, in business, I, my husband has a business, um, so I believe that it, it's something that I can do. I could do very well. More questions? Hi, Rachel Ringer in Port Angeles, and so. Um, I was going to ask you, those um, average phone calls that you get a year, which is, it's a lot, um, as you were saying before, that there's a great deal of um, low income and homeless coming into some of the areas. Um, so what is your most challenging thing as a commissioner in dealing with the numbers of calls that you do get out and that you need to do in policy changing for those things? All right, Mrs. Ms. Rackham Stall. Rackham Stall. <laughs> well, as a, I know what it's like as a volunteer. It can be overwhelming with the increase in calls, um, but that also takes um, dollars. So, as a commissioner, um, we have to find a way to find those dollars and find the resources and the um, people to serve the community. So it's a, always an ongoing um, job to say that we are always looking to be able to do the best we can for our community with the people and the funds we have, but it, with the growing number of calls, it's just like the city, um, you know, uh, we have to find ways to find the dollar and the personnel to meet that need. Right, Mr. Martin? Well, the other thing is, is that you can partner up with other uh, uh, organizations to uh, facilitate the need, um, but the the, the big thing is, once again, is, is funding. And uh, when I first got into the fire service, um, um, there wasn't a lot of funding. It just wasn't there. As it, as it came about more and more, um, we're being asked to do more than just what we started out as in the fire service. And uh, like I say, I'm, I'm part of the problem because I got us into it. <laughs> so now I got to figure out a way to help support it. And one of the ways you can do it in this particular case is partner with other organizations and get uh, the right people involved too. And do either of you wish a rebuttal? No? All right. More questions? Well, if there are no more questions, we will move to our two-minute closing statements. And we'll reverse the order from the opening statement. So, Ms. Reifenstahl, you go first. So, um, I have been a volunteer in this community. I've lived here since I was 16. I've done jobs that work with the public. I've taught half of Port Angeles how to swim. I know very many people, and I love serving the community and people, and I am responsible, I'm caring, 
I can learn whatever I need to learn to be a good commissioner, and I just ask you to vote for me in the upcoming election. Thank you. Mr. Martin. What I'm doing is, um, this is um, in, a, in a, a, a venue of continuing with the, uh, the fire district and moving forward. It's, it's something that we just don't sit on uh, our laurels. So uh, with my 12 years experience as a, a fire commissioner and the business aspect of running the district, um, I, I believe I have uh, a greater knowledge um, and skill of how we get things done and who we work with and what we're looking forward to and trying to get to there um, with what funds we do have. Um, I, I do uh, believe that, uh, that the district is um, something that I've worked hard with and I would want to continue with your vote to um, make it so we can sustain um, our projects and what we have in, in uh, our uh, plan down the road too. I, I would appreciate a vote. Thank you. Okay, before we close, um, are there candidates for other offices in the audience this evening? Yes, would you stand and just tell us who you are and what you're running for? My name is Steve Burke. I am currently the District 2 Port Commissioner and I'm on the ballot for District 2 Port Commissioner for re-election. I don't have an opponent, so they don't let me talk up there. <laughs> <laughs> All I can do is introduce myself. Thank um, you very much. But my, my day job is I run the pool, William Shore Pool, and there's a ballot initiative. I can't tell you to vote for it, but you need to vote. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Is there anyone else running for office? All right. I want to thank again our timers, uh, Tom and Helga Montgomery, and for all the league members who helped put this forum on. Um, it, it, they always run smoothly. That's because a lot of league volunteers make sure it runs smoothly. Um, I believe the candidates will stick around for one-on-one -on -one questions if you have any. And ballots will be mailed on October 18th. Please remember to vote on or before November 7th. And thank you again, everyone. Let's give a nice round of applause to our candidates. And on behalf of the League of Women Voters, I want to thank you for running for office. It's never easy, but it's an important civic thing that you do. Thank you. <laughs>